girl is one of the greatest things to hit gymnastics in this modern era. In 1972, the world discovered Olga Corbett. Her dazzling twists and tumbles at the Munich Olympics catapulted her to fame literally overnight. Magnificent movement. In three short exercises, she transformed gymnastics forever. Oh, isn't that superb? Absolutely superb. No one had witnessed anything quite so daring. And no one expected a 17-year-old girl from the Soviet Union to be quite so seductive. Olga instinctively flirted with the audience. She didn't blow them kisses or anything so obvious as that. But it was the smile, it was the little wiggles of her, of her wrists and hands, this sort of thing. Olga Korbut, UDSSR. But the story of how the girl from Belarusia became the darling of the West was never as straightforward as it seemed. Relations with both the Soviet authorities and her teammates were notoriously difficult. A lot of people didn't like her. It's in my country because she's not like everybody. She's different. And she never did try be like everybody. But it was her relationship with her coach, Renald Knish, that was the most turbulent of all. Only now is the real story beginning to emerge. You know, uh, before this interview, I wanted to forget everything, to forget what happened because this is the uh, hardest part in my life. I never talk and told about him bad words. But I think it's time to talk about this. OK, let's start from the floor. This is carpet where you're not allowed to step until you are a gymnast. This is bar. This is my favorite. Bars. All my life, sport life, when I did this element, I always care. Always. OK, Bolt. I didn't care about the Bolt, but I was good in the Bolt, by the way. OK, me this. I don't like to talk about the Bolt. OK, B. For me, this is a floor, because we don't supposed to think this is a beam. Otherwise, you will be out of the beam all the time. It's not difficult at all. It's all equipment, part of my life. встретился с Олей, я, когда она училась во втором классе, обходил классы, вторые, третьи классы, присматривался к девчонкам, делал объявление, что в школе открывается кружок гимнастики. Ну, первая, конечно, была я. Я подняла руку и, и чуть я со стула вся не вспрыгнула. И вот так началась моя мечта. I practice not just in the gym, I practice in my home. We had a small flat, but big room, enough to do gymnastics for me. And I move all equipment, all furniture to the wall, and I built a small gym in my room, and I did gymnastics. Home for Olga was a flat on the first floor of number three, Lenin Square, Grodno. 
When she was born in 1955, the town, just by the Polish border, was still recovering from the trauma of wartime occupation. Her father was an engineer and her mother was a cook. They had four daughters. Olga was the youngest. It was the time of the Cold War, the year the Warsaw Pact was signed, Burgess and McLean were exposed as spies, and Leica the dog was about to enter space. Heroes mattered then, and sportsmen, like cosmonauts, were vital to the Soviet image. Probably few things were as important as sports in the Soviet Union. They were, if you will, the proof positive that socialism was the superior system. After all, we had a tremendous structure, and it wasn't that expensive. And we had some really outstanding experts who knew how to produce these champions. And it was done in a way where uh, people were selected from childhood. And so, in 1965, at the age of 10, Olga left her PE classes and entered the Soviet sports machine. The Red Banner Sports School in Grodno was one of the 4,000 specialist sports schools in the Soviet Union. Each year, the school held trials to identify future champions. Olga was a small girl, a little girl, and very small, but she was a little bit afraid, but she was quite strong to perform all the exercises that were given. And maybe this kind of strength, maybe this kind of strength, то, что она, несмотря на то, что была меньше всех, она все-таки справилась с этими упражнениями. Может, вот и подкупила меня тем, что мне захотелось ее взять. One coach at the Red Banner, more than any other, had a reputation for being a gymnastic visionary, Ronald Knish. Knish was on a personal mission to revolutionize gymnastics. He'd already produced one Olympic champion. Olga would be his next. Я старался новый стиль вести, такой бодрый, резкий, безостановочный. А стиль был советский, так называемый. Это такой умирающего лебедя, так называемый, как я называл. Медленно, так это, плавно все. Одно движение не закончишь, уже начинаешь второе. А у меня вел резко, быстро, одно движение, за точное, точное окончание каждого движения. Одно за другим, очень много движений. До меня двигались примерно так, как по канату. Вот такие шажки делали. А я своими начал бегать по брюну, носиться по брюну, как по полу. Никакой разницы, чтоб не было. Knish was so obsessed with perfection, the rumor around town was that he kept a card index system with details of married couples who had the right genes to produce gymnastic offspring. Everyone wanted to work with Knish. And in 1966, Olga got her chance. And so began one of the more fateful teacher-pupil relationships in sporting history. Between them, Knish and Corbett pioneered a whole new style of gymnastics. Out went polite, balletic forms. In came bold and dazzling maneuvers. Olga was completely different because she did skill that nobody did this. And I think her coach wasn't care a lot how she looks. He just I want the skill. Olga, let's go do the skill. Because nobody did this. You can do it. And you will be different than everybody. He was crazy. He fanatic. So, and she did go with him. Two of them were very serious. The brain was broken. And her hand was broken. And her hand was broken. And her hand was broken. Нужно, чтобы она расправлялась, значит, нужно, чтобы на руке был груз. Она ложилась и привязывала сюда подушку. Ложилась спать, спала. И в связи с этим она потом начала выступать и все. On the surface, the brilliant Sven Gali and precocious pupil looked the perfect partnership. In reality, though, relations were far from easy. He pushed me very hard. Really very hard. 
you never say me thank you or very good or something else. I expect this, but I never get it, you know. This is, was very sad for me, and I started to think about it, why it happened. Когда я занимался с ней, она мне очень не понравилась. Почему? Она была очень ленивая, очень такая капризная, не любила делать то, что ей говорят, только, только, только то, что ей хочется делать, то делала. Как person, он просто очень нехороший человек. Очень нехороший человек. Он нелюдимый, он деспот, он э, просто ненормальный человек. Ну, как, как э, тренер он гениальный. At the heart of Knish's vision was the belief that gymnastics could become a sport with mass appeal. It wasn't just about skill, it was also about image. So he taught Olga to be natural. He taught her to smile. Он много над ней работал, работал над перед зеркалом, несмотря на то, что ей нужно было улыбаться, она плакала, потому что это многократное повторение, исполнение. Тренер понимал, что он должен заставить в тренировочном процессе. Обязательно тренируется эта улыбка. Вот и Ольга была вытренированная гимнастка, ту, которую ее знает зритель. Это все натренировано. Do you realize you practice every day, every day, 15, 20 hours, whatever, 10 years, 10 years, same thing, no rest, no holidays, no vacation, no Sundays, every day, no eat, no smoke, no drink, no boyfriend, no nothing, just practicing in gymnastics. Probably the hardest part of all was the constant pressure to stay thin. And Olga wasn't averse to the odd cigarette to stave off hunger. Like everyone else, she had her methods. Я всегда записывала, когда нужно скушать. И после этого дня я всегда проверяла и ставила себе оценку. Я справилась с этим или нет. Даже я считала глотки воды. The real trick to staying thin was to delay puberty. Whether Olga was given drugs for this is still not clear. Я этого даже не знаю. Я знаю, что когда приходит период у женщины, он немножко расслабляет организм. Это для гимнастки очень трудно. Я никогда не ощущала этого. Я не знаю, что это такое. Поэтому на эту тему. От меня собеседник очень плохой. After three years in the gym, Knish was finally ready to present his pupil to the public. In 1969, Olga performed in her first adult championship in Rostov. The crowds witnessed something never before seen in a major gymnastic competition, a spectacular back somersault on the beam and an even more daring back somersault on the bars. The audiences loved her. The officials didn't. Far from embracing her, they accused her of performing crude circus tricks. It wasn't difficult for me because I prepared this for years. This is what's difficult for government, for head coaches to see that. Because, because they don't want to change. If, for example, if you have a good team, you don't need a, some, somebody who will change this. They have enough salary, they have enough, they, they have very good team. Team always win. You know, they, they just don't want to change. For a while, the international authorities thought about banning Olga's back somersaults. But in the end, they were accepted, along with the rest of her stunts. By 1972, when she won the Soviet Gymnastics Cup, Olga was ready to claim her place in the Olympic team. But getting selected was another matter. Now it was not her gymnastics that was the problem, it was her attitude. 
Ольга, она, да, была интересная, она не, иногда не хотела подчиняться коллективу, но э, все-таки нас было больше в сборной, нас было, если уже брать команду, то пять человек, она была шестая, она вынуждена была подчиниться э, дисциплине команды. Although by now completely dependent on Knish, Olga always maintained that their relationship went no further than turbulent squabbling. But now, Olga is saying more. A few days before the Olympics, she says, Knish forced her to have sex with him. He prepared me for years, slowly. What did he prepare you for? What, what for sex. You... For sex. For... Yeah, for sex. If you uh, had an interview 72 or 73 and you asked me this question, I never pronounce a sex because for my hero is uh, is just sex, you know, without love. This is what I had. Ну, можно сказать, да. Ну, во-первых. Мне было больно очень, потому что я не хотела раз, я не была готова два. Это было первый раз. Я не любила. Понимаете, это все вместе, это изнасилование. Когда ты не хочешь, не любишь, боишься и так далее. Это все было у меня. Врет. Ну, вообще-то тренеры были такие, конечно, которые всю свою деятельность направляли на то, чтобы с ученицами заниматься этим самым. Но у них успехов никаких не было. Как только один начинается секс, там кончается спорт. Для чего же я портил? Семь лет жизни отдал ей, там, подстраиваясь под нее, каждый раз заставляя себя приходить, настраивать, упрашивать ее, для того, чтобы взять и перед Олимпийским миром все это дело сломать. И ничего не, не сделать. Но это же глупее придумать трудно что-нибудь. She told me, it's kind of a shock for me. It was shocked. Some I, I not agree, some I don't want talked about. And it's, I think it's wrong that she try show these bad things about him. If it is true, it's between her and between him. No, he never will say that it's right. And he wants to make me stop talking. Этого не будет. Он прекрасно знает, что это правда. Я не имею доказательств, никто не видел нас. Я не ищу доказательств. Мне начихать на это, честно сказать, абсолютно. Я просто хочу показать мою жизнь, какой она была. Короче, она потеряла всякое чувство мира. Сейчас вот. Говорит что угодно. Поступает... Да, никакие рамки не лезет. Вот каждый, есть у тренера такая поговорка, что каждый ученик должен в конце концов наплевать тренеру в душу. Так вот так наплевать, как это Корбут сейчас делает, вот мне, понимаете, по-моему, никто вообще даже из-за всех учеников, хотя все плюют тренеру в душу, никто не так не сделал в мире, наверное, как она. I'd like to build the world. In August 1972, Olga headed for Munich. Knish went too. In those days, individual coaches weren't always allowed official accreditation, so he went as a tourist and took his seat with the rest of the audience. What he and the crowd then witnessed were four days of gymnastics that would totally transform Olga's life. It was an immensely traumatic Olympics in many ways. It was the most dramatic Olympics I think I have ever been to, and I've been to eight. There was the tragedy of the Israeli team, many of whom were killed. Eight Arab guerrillas held nine Israelis hostage. We had Outside Rhodesia landing, being uh, kicked out of the games. We had a huge stories about people like Mark Spitz winning seven gold medals. So it was a tremendously dramatic games and it came across in Britain as no other games has done uh, up to that time. This is because the previous games television was really in its infancy. 
So these were the games where people were able to come home at six or seven o'clock in the evening and sit down and watch, of course, gymnastics. And this is why Olga had such an impact. First time I saw Olga was in training. We'd actually got a training session booked, and one of them was booked with the Russians. And um, the English team were pretty um, nervous about training with the Russians, I can tell you. I mean, I was knocked out with her when I saw her in the gym, absolutely. And she only looked about 13, 14 maybe. And none of us believed she was 17. Corbett was a girl. Um, and if you look at Corbett's face, it looks like a girl. But it's also, and this was the interesting thing, this is why she was so curious and interesting as a figure, was that look at the lines in that face, even of a girl of 17. That's from doing you know, 400 back somersaults onto a beam every day, that sort of routine. Olga's style didn't just conceal effort, it also concealed danger. A couple of inches out on this landing could end in a broken neck. Catching the bar after this loop was equally risky. If you do it a little bit less, you are out of the bar and you will have a concussion. If you do it like this, same thing. This very dangerous element. Ironically, because she had this image as a sweet little girl, they didn't notice that what she was doing was rather tough, very tough and require the kind of discipline, muscle, uh, courage that was necessary to any man in the most difficult sport that there was. The battle for medals at Munich lasted several days. The first gold medal up for grabs was in the team event. There was no question the Soviets were going to win it. They were so much better than everyone else. The real contest came with the individual gold for best all-round gymnast and only two contenders mattered. The reigning world champion, Ludmila Turisheva, and the young upstart, Olga Corbett. They both famous, but they completely different. And they didn't like each other. You know, they didn't understand. They didn't agree for each other. Turisheva was much more of the ideal Soviet citizen, controlled, precise, more technically correct, whereas Olga Corbett was someone that they regarded almost as a sort of eccentric. Uh, and although they used that eccentricity and liked to promote it, nevertheless, the th person they really liked was Turicheva. I mean, Turicheva's control was immense. I mean, we had the example at the World Cup at Wembley when she came off the asymmetric bar and as she dismounted off it, the bars collapsed. And the apparatus has collapsed. But she finished her exercise. Now, I wonder how that's going to be marked. And she didn't really look behind to see what was happening, because as far as she was concerned, you know, that was irrelevant to the performance that she'd just done. Now, I wonder whether the judges will... The discipline of that athlete was unbelievable. Put him in the ring, and nine times out of ten, Tereshova knocks her out. But the competition was the human factor. Again, Tereshova looked like a fully developed woman. Here you had this little girl with the braids and the, and the underdog, and that's where the competition really was. To everyone's surprise, it was Corbett, not Tereshova, who looked set to be the all-round champion. When she approached the bars, she was poised to take gold. What happened next put her on the front page of newspapers around the world. And this is the girl who, so far, has captured this audience and enchanted us all. This is the apparatus she totally excels at. Except for that disastrous start. Она когда потеряла снаряды, я уже был уверен на сто процентов, что сейчас она выбьется ногами в пол. Трени у тренера вообще, когда ученика много тренируют, у нее получается чувство ученика. И все чувствуешь, вот сейчас она выбьется, вот в этом месте она завалит, идет обязательно заваливает. And another disaster. And she's 
lost it. There, the gold medal, I'm certain, has gone. This girl who had everybody talking about her. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Especially that the, the first thing that she messed up was such a simple... Well, it was nothing. It was just the beginning part. It wasn't even a skill. And then after that, she just completely couldn't get it together. And the one event which could have captured gold for her, she has had a disaster. That picture says it all. She broke down and wept. That was not what you did, and that was so human. And I think that had a lot to do with her popularity, because I think that deep down inside, it was reassuring to a great many people all over the world that Soviets were actually human beings. I mean, the propaganda had gone so far in that Cold War that there was a sense that they were all the same, that they were produced by the same machine, they were cloned, and that here was someone who showed and proved that, no, they were individuals. By now, Corbett's tears were the story of the Olympics, her disaster on the bars only enhancing her popularity. The following day, she had to perform on the bars again in the competition on the individual apparatus. This time, she found herself at the center of an even more unlikely storm. This is one of the most remarkable exercises I have ever seen. It will be interesting to see how the judges mark it, but my goodness, that was quite fantastic. This little tiny girl, 17 years of age, moved between those beams, those bars, absolutely superbly. And everyone of this 11,000 crowd is giving tremendous applause for this girl. 9.8 is what she scored. They don't like it. I was wondering how the judges would accept it. Because although it is quite unique, perhaps it doesn't have the finesse of some of the other competitors. There's a lot of very, very good stuff in it, and the crowd is going absolutely mad. Hark at the roars, the whistles that are going on through this building as this mark of 9.8, which is equal highest and has put her in equal first place, is being received by the crowd. They just don't like it, and this competition will not go on while this noise is in progress. It was a very good performance, and it probably got what it deserved, but of course the public didn't think that it got what it deserved, and therefore that they were actually outraged that she should have um, been marked down, and so they were incensed by this attitude of the judges. And this girl, who's already been the scene of one incident in these uh, championships, is now, again, this time, has the support of the crowd, and the crowd's noise is getting more and more noisy. They're stamping their feet, they're whistling, and they're not going to let this competition go on. When they stopped the competition, they didn't understand what was happening. Why did they all scream? Why did they give me such a small score? Because I did everything. 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 In the end, the judges refused to change Olga's mark, and it was left to the East German Angelica Hellman to resume the competition. That is probably the lack of concentration. She deserves the applause. She stopped that crowd serving, and she deserves applause. Look at the girl. She is absolutely in tears. She had to face the most terrible odds. When it came to the medals, Olga had to settle for second place. Olga Corbett then gets the silver medal, so the gold... It wasn't just the audience who thought she'd been cheated. Most gymnasts at the time suspected that the Eastern Bloc judges tended to fix the medals between them. То есть судьи заранее знали, кто должен выиграть. Сейчас скажи им, или ты умрешь, или признайся, не признается. Потому что они считают, они, они сделали для своей страны правильно. Но существовал, например, наш социалистический лагерь существовал. Вся гимнастика того времени была самой сильной в наших соцстранах. Она была самой сильной. И несмотря на то, что мы вроде как были сильнее всех, 
Но этого же хотелось и Чехословакии, этого же хотелось и Германии, и Венгрии, потому что там тоже были достаточно хорошие гимнасты. Какая-то существовала такая тайная, слово понятно, тайная, секретная, проще сказать, секретная, план, такой секретный план вроде. Ну хорошо, Советскому Союзу отдадим там, ну, условно, пять медалей, а чтобы еще была одна там, одна там, одна там. Было. Не так, чтобы мы об этом говорили слух громко, не так, чтобы мы где-то это подписывались. Но вот как-то так было. When Olga finally got a gold medal for her performance on the beam, few doubted she deserved it. And they just love her, and she loves that gold medal. But it was the very last gymnastics event at Munich, the floor exercises, that would finally launch her into superstardom. Most people were expecting Tureshova to take the gold. After an almost faultless routine, she seemed unbeatable. But then it was Olga's turn. It was this performance that would end up being one of the most memorable moments in Olympic history. And so the final competitor in the final exercise of the 20th Olympiad women's gymnastics competition just happens to be Olga Corbett. Olga Corbett was laying second to Tureshova before the exercise started. If she gets has caused so many sensations here this evening, it just isn't true. And she's done it, she's done it, 9.9. .9. Olga Corbett wins the gold medal in the floor exercises. After when you finished routine and all team trying to hug you and con congratulate you, but uh, this is all fake. It's like Turishiva, if ever. She hugged me. I didn't see that it was fake. And so what a fantastic climax to the women's competition of the 20th Olympiad. This girl who on Sunday, I said, would be the darling of this... There are times when you play or you do something above your own ability. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're grade nine, but you do a 10. And I think that's what happened to her, was it? combination of factors where she she had the crowd she had this up she had the rush and she had the technique and it all came together and it worked magic Olga Corbett coming up again to receive a tremendous ovation and her second gold medal she captured the imagination of the public um, and people still remember her and they remember her for you know, what she contributed on that extraordinary week in, in Munich. Olga became the first star of gymnastics. She, she, she was a, a worldwide star. Wherever you went, everybody knew her name. Olga Corbett, a 17-year-old girl whose performance has since proved her one of the greatest drawing cards and personalities in sport today. She won't be famous. You can see this. She won't be famous. She won't everybody like her. Olga Corbett is with me here at the moment. She is so tiny, and I think that picture gives you an idea of how tiny she is. I feel I could put my hand around her waist and pop her in my pocket. It was clear Olga's charm exceeded the promotional impact of any cosmonaut or ballerina, and her government wasn't slow to catch on. She was being used for a very clear propaganda purpose and was extremely effective. Do you think that the po it wasn't the Politburo that decided that Olga would meet President Nixon? Do you think that didn't go up to the very, very, very top to Mr. Brezhnev? That's how high it went. There is no way that Olga Corbett could meet President Nixon. No way in the world without a decision of, at the very, very top. Oh, 
On the other side of the Houses of Parliament is an old church called Westminster Abbey. But the most interesting place here is the Poet's Corner. Back in Grodna, a year later, world-famous Olga Corbett was brought back down to earth. Tell us, please, something about London. Uh, London is the capital of Great Britain. Westminster uh, is the political centre of country. She may have been filmed in the classroom, but most of her time was spent with Knish in the gym. And it soon became apparent that fame had changed both of them. Тренироваться невозможно стало, а потом давай поездки за границу, опять тренироваться невозможно. Потом эти сотни корреспондентов, понимаете? Как после этого? Каждый вечер помнишь миллиардеры, вечер какой-нибудь там, где Оля, 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 Оля. Уже у них отношения складывались немножко по-другому, потому что Оля, быть может, думала, это я только свою точку зрения высказываю, Оля, быть может, думала, что уже можно на этом остановиться, уже можно показывать то, что ты наработал. Ринальд Иванович, этого было мало. У него уже была новая цель, которую нужно было по-новому идти, опять карабкаться по этим ступенькам работы ежедневной, еже, как говорится, такой упорной, трудной работы. И Оля повзрослела уже. И Оля повзрослела. Не ругались, не, не кричали друг, но внутри, я думаю, что да, мы всегда ругались. Мы всегда были не согласны друг с другом. Но перед 72-м годом я никогда этого не высказывала. А после 72-го года я начала просто это говорить. И для него это было... Неприемлемо, наверное. Перед тем, как тренировать ее, каждый раз она строила себя дома. Вот такие ноги, знаете, убеждают себя, самоубеждением убеждением занимался. Что раз уж я ее взял, я, конечно, должен с ней обращаться очень ласково, очень хорошо. Примерно так, как вот в цирке обращаются эти дрессировщики с обезьянками. I never see and he respect Olga like person. For him, Olga was just gymnast, just person who doing his idea, you know. I never saw that he liked her, you know. He all the time talked with her, kind of rude, make her like pinch uh, some word, like I, I didn't like. For me, so many times I was like shocked. Он стал меня бить, когда я стала развиваться. Он ревновал меня. Он думал, что у меня есть кто-то. Мне начали э, грудь расти, мне начал меняться все, у меня начала фигура другая быть. А он замечал, что я не девочка уже. И он от ревности, он просто от ревности бил меня иногда, что я его не слушаю, что я имею свое слово. И один раз я запомню это навсегда. In front of everybody in the gym, he beat me. He broke my hair. Один раз в жизни было. Но этого достаточно было, чтобы она возненавидела меня на всю жизнь. Ах, он меня, меня президенты руку жали мне там, миллиардеры руку целовали мне, а он мне пощечину дал такой секой. Вот так-то. Olga and Knish finally parted company in early 1975. She went on to train with Knish's wife, Tamara Alexeyeva. 
Но я была счастлива, что я убежала от него. И снова я начала работать с нормальным отношением, как должно быть, между гимнасткой и тренером. The following year was spent in Grodna preparing for the next big event, the Montreal Olympics. Expectations were high, but it was soon clear that Olga without Knish was not the same Olga. In the end, she only managed one team gold and one silver medal on the beam. For the audience, the novelty was wearing off. Besides, a new star was being born. Nadia Komenich. display from Kamenech. Canadian championship performance. Ten. The score that we said made Olympic history only days ago, now becoming commonplace for Nadia Kamenech. Последний год я уже работала на последнем из немождений просто. Я не хотела работать, я хотела уйти, у меня были стрессы, я уходила, я приходила опять. Вот что произошло со мной после Монреаля. Я просто ушла из гимнастики навсегда. Six months after Montreal, Olga retired, but she left her mark on the sport. Since Olga, gymnastics is no longer one of the more obscure Olympic sports. It's now one with some of the highest ratings on TV. But there was also another effect. After Olga, the pressure for more elaborate and risky routines increased dramatically. And so did the pressure to be smaller, younger and thinner. She changed gymnastics since she changed gymnasts. There are no grown-up gymnasts anymore. There are no mature young women who, who look like women doing gymnasts. Doing gymnastics, the sport has changed. You cannot win if your body has reached maturity. And I think that is very sad. We did have a sort of anorexia problem in gymnastics, and no doubt about that at all. You know, um, you know, people were stopped from you know, eating as they would like to eat, because the lighter you are, the better. Despite rumors of infertility caused by the training regime, all six members of the 1972 Soviet team went on to have children. Olga herself had a son, Richard, in 1979, a year after her marriage to a Belarusian pop star, Leonid Bortkevich. For the next 12 years, she lived in Minsk, where she worked, among other things, as a sports administrator. Then, in 1986, 200 miles down the road, disaster struck. The Russians have revealed little during the day of the extent of the accident at a nuclear power station in the Ukraine, but it is clear that this is a major disaster. After Chernobyl, Olga and her family decided to leave the Soviet Union forever, and in 1991 they moved to the United States. Today, Olga lives in South Jersey and trains young Olympic hopefuls at the Flyers Gymnastics Academy in Hamilton. Olga may be a few years older, but she can still show them a thing or two. Within a few months of settling into her new coaching job, Olga suddenly quit after some of her pupils complained about her tyrannical training methods, a telling twist after her experiences with her own coach. Earlier this year, Olga and Leonid divorced, and Olga has since remarried. She now lives in a suburb of Atlanta in a house dedicated to her Olympic glory. Okay. This is Munich gold medal. This is Montreal gold medal. This is Munich silver medal. This is Montreal gold medal. This, I have all four gold medal and two silver. This is just two gold, two silver. Two gold medals on the museum in Moscow and in Grodno. When I got from Munich, they said to me, you have three gold, can you give us one? And I say, okay. <laughs> That's it. This is last time when I saw my gold medal. In 
It's hard to think of a sport with a shorter career span than gymnastics. And it's hard to think of a sport where the difference between the time spent training and the time spent performing is so great. Olga Korbut spent seven years training for four days in Munich. Yet it was those four days that transformed her from an ordinary gymnast into an icon of her era. For me, gymnastics was to amaze, to And I think that I did it.